thank you very much for coming to this talk to speak uh, a little bit about uh, some theoretical issues with regard to the study of nationalism and ethnicities as most of you are aware uh, contrary to various predictions about uh, withering away of nations and nationalisms put forth by some generations of sociologists, uh, let's say development theorists, modernization theory, Marxist theory, etc. We, ha we are witnessing uh, a surge in nationalism and ethno-nationalism and all kinds of ethnic strife around the world apprehensions about uh, future developments. And let's not forget that right in front of our very eyes there is a major uh, case of ethnic cleansing is going on in Myanmar where uh, thousands of ethnic Rohingyas, uh, Muslim Rohingyas are being driven away from homeland and already I suppose about 500,000 of them have been forced to leave the country and take refuge in neighboring Bangladesh. So this state of affairs highlights the importance of uh, conflicts which have roots in group identities. I'm generally referring to all these uh, issues in the context of identity-based conflicts or identity-based movements. Uh, nationalism, ethno-nationalism, religious fundamentalism, all of these phenomena, in my opinion, are basically different forms of identity mobilization. Um, the ethnic issue in particular is a recurring source of strife in most countries of the world if we consider the fact that with the exception of, of just a few countries, uh, perhaps Korea, North or South Korea and a few other countries, uh, the rest of the current existing nation states um, embody a diversity of different cultural or linguistic groups or in other words uh, they are composed of different ethnicities and even in countries where uh, at least to this point we don't observe any major ethnic strife there is always a chance that in future such conflicts may uh, flourish Okay, um, when I refer to the recent referendums, there seems to be a clear-cut tension between two long-standing international principles, namely between the Wilsonian principle of self-determination for any group of people who think on the basis of their particular culture and distinctness, they constitute a nation and they have a right to form their own government. And on the other hand, the seemingly unswerving principle of territorial integrity of the existing nation state. I mean, just let's, let me just again refer to the Spanish or the Catalan referendum and just uh, mentioned that uh, no European country has really uh, accepted this, the results of this referendum and in spite of all the provisions within the European community for uh, distinct peoples or national minorities uh, the uh, national integrity of Spain is being uh, 
uh, basically uh, put above any demands for uh, secession. Um, okay. It's interesting to note that even the seemingly strong trend toward globalization and formation of various uh, regional unions and common economic or political structures, we are already witnessing a great deal of national resistance to such uh, forms of integration. And it seems uh, some of the existing supranational arrangements uh, experience in various parts of the world, including the European Union, are under a uh, great deal of strain. I mean, just take Brexit, for example, or uh, the kind of mobilization some uh, nationalist, rightist groups or parties are uh, basically indulging in, in various European countries. Okay, today I'd like to touch upon some of the main theoretical issues involved in the study of nationalism and ethnic diversity by paying special attention to the case of Iran, the country I was born in and in which I continue to work as a professor of sociology. Along the way, as I delineate some of my thoughts about uh, Iranian scholars' uh, approaches towards study of this problem, I'll try to uh, basically deal with some of the problematics that we have in theorizing uh, issues of nationality and ethnicity, and also uh, delve into some of the political implications that any um, definitions or any conceptualizations may have. Well, let me begin with Iran and give you a very short uh, overview of the ethnic landscape in Iran. Iran is a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional society. Depending how one defines ethnicity, around a third of the population could be classified as ethnic by any definition we use. Even a minimal definition would put us at that figure. I don't really want to argue about figures because there is a wide range of different figures given on ethnicity. I mean, I mean, putting Iran aside, we see the same problem even in Canada and elsewhere, you know. So uh, when it comes to counting different uh, ethnic groups or racial groups, there is always a great deal of problem. Okay, those ethnic groups whose ethnicities are considered most salient by group members themselves or by non-members as well are the Kurds who inhabit uh, the western and northwestern parts of Iran, the Turkmens in northeastern Iran, the Arabs in southwest, the Baluchis in southeast and parts of the eastern uh, Iran. There are two uh, salient features about all these ethnic groups that I mentioned. First, almost all of them inhabit the border areas of Iran. They live on the flanks of the mainland, okay? Which strategically puts them in a very important uh, part of the country. Secondly, with the exception of Azaris, or Azerbaijanis and Arabs, who are Shiites basically, the other ethnic groups that I mentioned are from Sunni faith. Let me mention that most Iranians, majority of Iran's population, belong to the Shiite branch of Islam. Okay, 
at the same time, I should mention that we cannot really consider contemporary Iran to be a deeply divided society on the basis of its ethnic, linguistic, or regional characteristics. At least not so far. I mean, up to this point, we can't really uh, find Iran to be a deeply divided society. Of course, there are others who would argue that uh, these deep divisions may exist in Iranian society given the strong ideological rifts that exist inside the country. But my main concern is with uh, ethnicities at the moment. I think two factors have really helped Iran to avoid deeply troubling ethnic tensions that are so rampant in some other societies, including some of the neighboring countries like Iraq, uh, let's say Syria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc. Uh, although I should uh, ascertain that none of the two factors I'm about to mention can really guarantee a conflict-free future. Because as we all know, identity-based conflicts are very fluid and they can erupt instantaneously for no rhyme or reason. And it, they can spread, they can become really intense. You know, even in uh, societies which have had no such experience for many generations. Anyway, the factors that I like to stress are the following. First, continuation of some kind of central political authority or a sense of statehood at the heartland of Iranian plateau combined with Persian as the dominant literary administrative language. I mean, both of these factors are quite ancient. They have survived many, many generations. And the second factor that I like to mention is the rather uh, successful process of nation building, or let's say modern nation building, that has started uh, since uh, early 20th century and more or less uh, has created a sense of uh, national unity among all Iranians, no matter uh, what ethnic or religious group they belong to. I mean, this is a let's say, a fortunate uh, outcome of uh, the whole politics of nation building, no matter how severe or harsh at certain times these politics may have been. Uh, but again, I need to emphasize that history and historically shaped trends and arrangements may not mean much when group emotions are mobilized on the basis of intense group identifications. Well, to study the issue of ethnicity and nationalism, most of the terms we use uh, are basically controversial. They are contested terms, not only because of their theoretical underpinnings, but also because of serious political implications that they could have. Let's begin with the contested term nation. It is commonly referred to political communities that have acquired international recognition as independent sovereign states. The term is also used by some sub-state cultural communities to define their communities as such and portray themselves as stateless nations. 
Then there is a rather novel concept, national minorities, used by some international organizations and some countries to refer to distinct cultural groups in a given nation state that are suspected to be treated differently by their governments or other citizens or may need some uh, special treatment because of their uh, be to become full-fledged citizens and enjoy the same rights that others are enjoying. Well, the controversy over the term nation is also present in the case of a related problem, namely with regard to the origins of nations. How did nations came about? How did they emerge? At what particular time in history could we say that modern nations have emerged. Can we, pinpoint to some, can we pinpoint to some nations as ancient nations, as some argue, or all or nations politically shaped structures that emerged in modern times and specifically in the aftermath of the 30 years wars that plunged Europe into major bloodshed and finally was resolved by the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Well, let's look at both issues jointly. Once a community inside an already existing country defines itself as a nation or is recognized as a national minority, we are immediately faced with the question of how it is incorporated into a larger nation state and how terrible the existing political institutions and arrangements are to hold the parts together. And of course, the political question of the rights of uh, such nations or national minorities comes to mind and uh, whether they'll have a right to uh, ask for self-determination, for secession, or they need to remain an integral part of an existing nation state. I mean, these are such questions, the kind of questions that immediately would emerge if you uh, define a group as a nation or a national minority or, or as a stateless nation or whatnot. Well, in Iran, based on my own research and uh, a variety of research that I've already examined, <clears throat> the idea of a distinct nation may only exist among some Kurds, not anywhere else, not among any other ethnic group. And even among Kurds, according to my own experience, only among some educated Kurds. Uh, other ethnic groups, notwithstanding their claims to particular cultural traits, such as distinct languages, customs, etc., do not really imagine themselves to be nations or national minorities. Uh, at the same time, at the highest levels of government, the word minority is specifically reserved for religious minorities. And the official line strictly uh, avoids such terms as minorities or ethnic minorities uh, to refer to ethnic groups. There is a very clear policy in that regard. Uh, although the words ethnicities or ethnic groups are readily used in the official uh, language or among scholars. Uh, even the constitution of the Islamic Republic recognizes uh, the uh, multiplicity of ethnic groups in Iran and even grants them some special rights. Uh, but the emphasis in the Constitution uh, is on uh, equality of uh, 
uh, rights for all ethnic groups. I mean, that uh, emphasis on all basically, uh, in a way, uh, reduces the whole idea of distinctiveness of uh, ethnic groups. The word minorities is reserved for religious minorities. And by that, it is meant people of the book, namely Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians. Other Islamic groups or sects, like Ismailis, Sunnis, etc., they are all classified as Muslims. There is no line separating them as citizens uh, from uh, the Twelver Shiites. In other words, the term ethnic group or religious minority are not used for various Muslim groups. Okay. Well, to sum up this uh, definitional matter, uh, the word ethnic group or ethnicity is recognized, but nations or national minorities is shunned. And there is very clear uh, demarcation between the two. And when it comes to debate over the origins of nations, needless to say that the literature on nations and nationalism is divided between the perennialists on the one hand and the modernists on the other, between those who consider at least some nations to be ancient or predate modern period, and if not nations, some similar notions of nationhood has existed uh, perennially at all times among various groups. So in other words, we shouldn't consider nation a modern term. Then on the other hand, we have the modernists who argue that uh, nations are strictly a modern creation. Prior to that, we had different communities like empires, uh, city-states, uh, uh, protectorates, or other, other forms of uh, arrangements uh, basically political arrangements to rule over a group of people. Uh, I suggest that we shouldn't confuse the perennialist, modernist dichotomy with, the, with another theoretical divide, net, uh, namely the divide between uh, primordialists and constructionists. Uh, I mean, these two um, approaches are basically theoretical approaches to the problem. And um, um, again, they take two very different lines when it comes to uh, study of nations and how they have emerged. Primordialists argue that uh, uh, nations and even ethnic groups or ethnic communities uh, basically uh, create a very strong bond among members because they have a notion of some common lineage or some common kinship. Or historically they have developed uh, so much of cultural affinities that have uh, led to a sense of kinship among them. You know, this um, allegorical reference to kinship group is very important to understand the primordialist position. Constructionists, on the other hand, point to various vagaries of history, as well as active practices of agencies in constructing a sense of solidarity group among certain populations, especially by means of drawing group boundaries 
and strict rules of inclusion, exclusion, and cultivating strong feelings about in-groups and out-groups, us versus them. The perennial modern controversy is essentially a chronological controversy, a subject for the historians to study, in my opinion. Whereas the primordial constructionist divide has to do with sociological arguments about the process of identity formation in various human groups. I agree with Trevor Harrison and some other authors in his joint uh, edited book with Draculic. Do I pronounce his name correctly? Yeah. Uh, the book, in, in this book, um, uh, which is uh, basically a book on rejection of some common orthodoxies on both sides of the divide. Uh, the main argument is that uh, the positions taken by both sides of the divide in, a, in many ways actually is hindering our understanding of nationalism. It is true that at a, a particular juncture in history, um, well, sorry, it is true that contrary to the modernist position, nations could not just have popped out of nothing at a particular juncture of history. And also it's true that perennialists miss the point that claimants to nationality in general reinterpret their community's past history in ways most suitable their, to their contemporary concerns. Well, in spite of that, I personally adhere to the constructionist position. Of course, there are many different approaches within constructionist camp, but I think constructionism provides us with a theoretical correction to the controversy and opens up a better way of understanding nationalism and the whole process of nation formation. Let me just cite one example that goes beyond this uh, debate among primordial, primordial, uh, I mean perennialist versus modernist. Uh, the example I'm citing is from uh, 16th century Iran, Iran under uh, a dynasty called Safavid dynasty. Okay, here we are not dealing with a country that's influenced by modern notions of nation or nationalism, etc. When Safavid's rulers came to power in the 16th century, they began a whole process of constructing a new identity for their subjects. Um, they were really apprehensive of two very strong powerhouses uh, in their neighborhood. From the east, it was the uh, strong uh, domain of um, the Ottoman Empire, a Sunni uh, empire threatening Iran. And in the east and northeast, basically northeast of the country, uh, the, the, this new Safavid dynasty was facing uh, the uh, Uzbek um, uh, nomadic uh, dynasties against Sunnis who were threatening the borders of the country. So the most politically expedient uh, project for the Safavids was to inculcate a sense of distinctness among Iranians. And they began a whole process of Shiitization of the country. Of course, Shiism had existed all along in Iran, but among some minorities. But they began a, a full-fledged, overarching project of Shiitization of Iran to resist the threats from two Sunni domains. So this the whole process uh, is very much uh, fits in the whole constructionist explanation that how uh, rulers or elites or 
other groups perhaps could really uh, begin a whole process of identity formation. The Safavids also digged in a lot of uh, existing cultural material in Iran. And for example, they uh, spread this claim that they are descendants of the Holy House of the Prophet of Islam. Uh, they probably conjured up some lineage, some line of bloodline to the Prophet. And at the same time, they argue that uh, they take descent from ancient pre-Islamic Iranian kings of the Sasanian uh, Empire. Uh, of course, as far as we know, the Safavids came from some Turkic tribes. Their main um, domain was in eastern Anatolia. Actually, most of the tribes that, that constituted the Safavid uh, kingdom in Iran came from those regions. And how they could have taken descent from ancient Persians, nobody knows. But they did conjure that up, and it was accepted by the majority of the people. So by citing that example, I think we can really go uh, somewhat, we can go beyond the, this whole controversy if we take a particular version of construct, constructionist approach. Well, it's interesting that even primordialists who base their arguments on uh, ties of kinship to explain the importance of descent in the genesis of any ethnic or national group concede that such sentiments do not necessarily emanate from real bloodline or descent, but rather from a perceived belief in such lineage. The same holds true for the issue of origins. Take Wal Walker Connor, for example, uh, a very uh, strong advocate of primordialist position. He clearly states that the real origin of a nation is not that important. What matters is the way members view themselves as an eternal nation, as a perennial nation. In other words, he is, in spite of being a primordialist, he's really taking a constructionist position. He's arguing that reality, reality is socially constructed. Going back to Iran again, most Iranian scholars who have written or commented on the country's ethnic and national issues tend to see Iran as an ancient nation with some kind of central state or at least uh, a central state since the Achaemenid Empire in 550 BC if not even prior to that, during many empires of the Medes or other dynasties. This approach on the part of Iranian academics really am amounts to what Draculic terms academic nationalism. Draculic talks about four particular categories of academic nationalism, imperialist, Marxist, Hesperian and liberal. I'd like to expand on his ideas and argue that the academic nationalist position could also be ob observed in other contexts, including what I considered academic nationalism in the context of Iranian academic writing. Most Iranian scholars, wary of the dangers to Iran's national unity, insist that the Iranian case is indeed unique among other nations and should not be specifically confused with national units artificially concocted by colonialists elsewhere in the Middle East or in other words in other parts of the African and Asian continents. They argue that in spite of a considerable di diversity in terms of cultural and linguistic traits, all Iranians have historically constituted one indivisible nation. Some even find it unacceptable to use 
such seemingly innocent terms as ethnic groups or ethnicities. And they prefer to use uh, other terms like linguistic groups or cultural groups instead of ethnic groups because they argue that these terms are basically terms imported from Western sociology into Iranian scholarship. Um, like, for example, they use, uh, I mean, this is really a common usage among some Iranian scholars who are in, infused with this, what, what I refer to as uh, academic nationalism. They, uh, they even refer to some ethnic groups uh, in terms like Arab-speaking Iranians or Turkish-speaking Iranians, instead of saying Arabs or Turks, you know. I mean, there is a lot of uh, connotation behind such. I mean, these terms are not innocent. I mean, we know discourses do matter. They have implications. Well, let's take the word secessionism or any perceived overture to secessionism in the academic world in Iran is really disparaged. It's a taboo term. You should not ever use it. And by definition, secessionism or any inclination that shows signs of secessionism among a minority or among a, an ethnic group is immediately associated with foreign conspiratorial designs to dissolve the nation. But it's interesting, the same academicians who uh, are adamant about uh, any particularistic demands on the part of, um, uh, let's say, ethnic groups uh, and look at them with suspicion. When it comes to other existing nation states in the region, especially the Arab countries, they immediately lose their sensitivity uh, towards uh, issues like national integrity and um, consider these countries, countries like Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc., as more or less fabricated entities uh, with no uh, history, no nationhood whatsoever. And uh, in, in that sense, they are not really entitled to their current borders either. For example, when this whole issue of Kurdish referendum came up, I mean, forget about the official line the Iranian state is taking, the Iranian government is taking toward the issue, but some um, Iranian nationalists, some academicians, uh, in a way um, began uh, arguing that, well, it's fine, I mean, after all, uh, Kurds are not Arabs, they are ethnically, they are Iranians, and they shouldn't be part of Iraq. I mean, so the whole idea of national integrity loses its worth when it comes to others, you know. So this is exactly what an academic nationalism is all about. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are other positions on the Kurdish referendum, for example, another nationalist position on the issue in Iran is, well, uh, I mean, if they get their independence from Iraq, then there is always a danger that this whole Kurdish nationalism may spill over to Iran and Iranian Kurds may have the same, uh, basically, uh, they may raise the same demands and ask for, a, uh, for some kind of uh, self-rule or some kind of uh, self-government. So again, there is some kind of apprehension among uh, Iranian nationalism in that regard. Okay, let me, before discussing the concept of ethnicity and the relevant issues it brings up, uh, conclude my discussion of nationalism uh, by, a, I mean, with a comment by Jennifer Jackson Priest, who mentions that whoever says the terms of the debate also sets the criteria for national membership and belonging, a power few nationalists are prepared to relinquish. 
Uh, okay, since I'm really approaching my last minutes, let me just have a few concluding remarks. Uh, the word ethnicity, ethnic groups, and ethnic minorities found currency in American sociology to denote people of different origins who had emigrated to the U.S. and manifested cultural and linguistic differences with the majority. It was then picked up by scholars elsewhere and applied to cultural communities that were not necessarily migrants to the society under discussion. Now, when it comes to Iranian academic writing on the issue of ethnicity, again we find uh, some who uh, oppose the very term ethnic group or ethnicity and its usage for Iranian uh, landscape. The opponents argue that these communities have existed in their current homelands for many centuries. They, they are not immigrants to this land. And they have developed very close cultural ties with the rest of the people. And they have uh, so much affinities with the rest of the population that in spite of uh, the diversity we find in uh, linguistic sense or cultural sense among different groups, they don't really constitute ethnicities per se. Yet the same, the very same authors when it comes to some specific demands raised by members of these groups, they immediately brand them as the Persian word Qom Yera, literally meaning ethnic zealots. Here they don't mind using the word ethnic when it comes to criticizing their demands, okay? Uh, ethnic zealots, Qom Yera. The very term Qom Yera, or I, 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 see, the word literally means ethnicist. But ethnicism in Western, in, in English language usage has a different meaning. So I try to avoid that. I prefer to use et, uh, ethnic zealot, not even ethno-nationalist, because it goes beyond that. Because it's a very general term. When people use, when some academics use, or officials for that matter, when they use the word qom gera, or ethnic zealot, it can include any demands from very simple demands about, let's say, um, having newspapers in their own languages or uh, letting to have children get schooling in their mother tongues, all the way to demands for secession. They all fall under one term. It really obfuscates the whole issue of ethnic relations, you know, when you, when you use that term. I mean, the term has such a heavy load of ideology. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me just pass over this. Don't have much time. Um, Well, uh, in the social scientific literature, meanings attributed to ethnic groups, et ethnicities, ethnies, etc., are somewhat controversial. And um, it's also controversial that how we can define a nation out of an ethnic group. Um, Personally, I have serious problems with any objective definitions, both for ethnic, ethnic groups and nations. Um, basically, the reason for my objection is that I consider all these uh, groups to be identity groups. And identities, by definition, are constructed. It's the way people define themselves. It's the way people refer to their personal or group uh, sense of self. 
attempts to come up with a plausible definition that combines the objective aspects with subjective ones don't seem convincing either. For example, Paul Brass, a well-known uh, scholar in the field of ethnic studies, uh, tries to make some definitional distinctions. He uses three different concepts, ethnic category, ethnic community, and nation. The first notion, ethnic uh, uh, category, indicates some kind of objective definition based on specific cultural markers that differentiate a group from others. The second one, or ethnic community, is a more subjective term and connotes ethnicity or a sense of ethnic identity. I mean, he tries to use the Marxist uh, distinction between class in itself and class for itself, or a, an objective definition of class as it is, and class consciousness, okay? Um, and in the same way, he differentiates between um, ethnic category and ethnic community. And he reserves uh, the term ethnic, um, 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 yeah, and, 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 and when it comes to the word nation, he argues that nations are ethnic groups that have become politicized and they have realized that they have specific rights that could only be satisfied in, a, in an independent political system. And of course, we have Anthony Smith who uses the word ethne to avoid this whole problem. He takes this French word ethne uh, to denote um, various ethnic communities that existed in almost all societies. In other words, he's trying to find a functional equivalent for modern term nation. Um, Anthony Smith agrees that nationalism as an ideology is a modern term, is a modern movement. But he thinks nations are not necessarily modern. We find nation-like entities that he calls ethnies in pre-modern times. Okay, I think I'm already going above my time limit. If you permit me, I will just, yeah. No, it's okay, it's okay. I mean, sure, sure, I think we can do that probably. Thank you very much.